I'm Rob Schilling, Chair of the Washington Road Community Trail. Welcome to the WRC Speaker Series. Throughout the year, we will host events to feature speakers covering a variety of topics. They'll range from environmental concerns, photography, gardening techniques, and more. These events are informational, fun, and free. So bring your family and friends. Go to our website at www.wrctrail.org to check out upcoming schedule of events that you won't want to miss. I want to welcome the Carroll County community here to uh, celebrate the completion of this beautiful Washington Road Trail. I, I think uh, uh, the community has come out in tremendous spirit to make this possible for all of us to enjoy and to enjoy a little bit of nature. Uh, in nature, one thing we always uh, advocate is that we only leave footprints and take pictures. So uh, many of you will be taking advantage of this with your cameras. And I wanted to give you some insight from a professional's perspective about photography, and particularly the limitations of photography and how we overcome those limitations. Because uh, I, a wonderful, wonderful art teacher of mine said that the uh, best artists in the world always worked with their limits to expand to an infinite uh, number of possibilities. So today I've brought this array of gear and normally no one in their right mind would travel this trail with this much equipment. But I wanted to give you a sense of the roots of photography so that when you're out there, what I want you to understand is that even your cell phone can be a legitimate camera for hiking this trail. It doesn't have to be a special DSLR camera. Don't think of yourself as limited as a photographer just because you don't own something like this. A point and shoot, a simple cell phone. If you wanted to be more fancy, you could bring a tablet with a camera built in. So today I'm going to talk about all of these in relationship that, 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 to the beginnings of photography. Every camera you own goes back to an ancient technology, a technology that was discovered in the 5th century BC in China. So the camera predates the concept of photography. And so with your cell phone, with your DSLR, you're going to be using very, very ancient wisdom and knowledge. First, you see the Dorea here. The first thing I tell all my, my photo students at McDaniel College is that we must think like a camera. Our brain doesn't do that. Our brain works for many other reasons, for our survival, for our enjoyment, but the camera thinks differently. And so what you have to do is learn how to frame like a camera, as opposed to the way our vision sees this huge sweep of information. In fact, much of the big picture we see prevents us from seeing the details that are already there. Every little detail that you see makes up the big picture. The camera highlights the details. The camera can never take in the big picture. You are always restricted by the frame. The other thing we have to understand in photography is there are limits to what the camera can see compared to the eye. Our eye and brain's ability to see me in the shadow here, as well as the bright areas in the daylight. The camera cannot. The camera is limited on how much bright and how much dark it can see. And it's all based on this concept of what we call 18% gray. This is the middle gray that our eye sees as normal. So does your camera. 
But when we expose for a gray area, that doesn't mean we can actually see a white area in our picture or a deep black. So regardless of how expensive your equipment is, remember it is limited, it's not as good as our eye. So what is a camera? Well, the camera is actually an Italian word, which means room. That's right, when we are picking up camera, we are picking up a miniature room that is darkened, that is blackened, that has no light coming into it. And in Italian, we would say obscura, to obscure. We use this Latin word in the English language all the time. So when we compare a combined obscure with room, we have a darkened room. And that's what a camera is, is a darkened room. And what we want to do with that darkened room is introduce a little bit of daylight from outside. And the Chinese philosopher in the fifth century dis discovered that if you have a tiny, tiny pinhole opening in a curtain, in a window pane, even in a wall, that light streaming into a darkened room will project the outside image on the wall. So that ancient technology has been synthesized down to what we call today a modern pinhole camera. See, my pinhole camera even has Leonardo da Vinci's face on the back, celebrating how old this technology has been used. And a pinhole camera is a darkened space, a darkened room, an obscured room inside. We put our film or our digital sensor in the back. We will have film or a digital sensor that would slip into the rear. So now we have a sealed off darkened room. And back in Italian Renaissance time, they would do this with a large parlor in their mansion. The, you know, the Medici would have a palace and they would dedicate one of their large rooms to this parlor trick. They would invite their friends and they would sit in chairs. And then they would send their servant boy, Giuseppe, out onto the balcony of this palace. And Giuseppe would go to the balcony window and open the shutter to that window. He would open the shutter. This is why a camera has a shutter. It is taken directly from the shutters we use on the sides of our house. And when we open the shutter, it reveals in this camera, a tiny slip of metal with the tiniest, tiniest little pinhole drilled into it. And then the daylight will come through that pinhole and expose your digital back or your film. It's simple as that. This is how your modern cell phone works. And for this large pinhole camera, we would use a sheet of film of this size. It's eight by 10, eight inches by 10 inches. So, so this is the ancient roots to what we use today. The problem is, when we look into this back, we see no image. Even if we were to put a piece of tracing paper here, we would have to put a heavy, heavy quilt over our head, blocking all, out all the light, and then sit there and wait for our eyes to adjust before the little pinhole of light registers an image on the tracing paper. It would take a long time, and on a hot day like today, we would not like to be under that quilt. So, our wonderful Italian Renaissance thinkers did away with a the pinhole. They brought this technology 
by a Greek in the 5th century BC, a fellow named Aristophanes. And what he mentioned in a play was the use of a burning glass, a magnifying glass. And the Phoenicians used to use glass to start fires, and the Greeks did it as well. So the Italian Renaissance thought, well, this pinhole, this doesn't let enough light in. But we know a magnifying glass will. And we had guys like Galileo crafting their own telescopes to see to Jupiter and beyond. So, what we needed to do is open this up, is to take optics and apply it to the box. And that's what the brilliance of the Italian Renaissance brought us. With this. A bellows style camera that we all remember from our history books of those famous guys like Matthew Brady and uh, O'Sullivan and whatnot going to, just up the road to Gettysburg. Bear with me as I try to. <laughs> photographing the tragedy of, of uh, the Battle of Gettysburg. And they would use, I'm really wrestling today, something like this. This is just a pinhole camera, but we now can mount a lens to it. So let's do that. And the trouble with all older forms of technology, and you'll discover also with modern technology with our cell phone, is that it's really hard to hold a camera steady when the light isn't very good. If you're walking the trail and you're in deep shadow, I'm sorry to wrestle with this. <laughs> It's always harder when you're on camera. I'll get it. It's just a matter of lining it up. There we go. What, what we'll discover today is that even on this trail, we may need a tripod. We may encounter situations that we will blur our pictures with our cell phone, our tablet, or our DSLR when we're not using a tripod. So I wanted you, whoops, wanted you to see the roots of our modern day photography. And so instead of a piece of tracing paper, Oops. Get this tighter. I see what I'm doing wrong. Instead of using tracing paper, this is our viewfinder. This is just like the liquid display screen on your cell phone. But unlike our cell phones and our modern DSLR, these ancient cameras did not have zoom lenses. They had lenses that could only see in one way. So we would put our lens, turn this around so the audience can see. So we would place our lens on the front of the camera. And we would open the lens up so we let the light through. That's what our shutter is for. 
And with this old-fashioned style camera, we will still need to obscure ourselves. We will not be able to see very well through here. And so what we do, just like the Italian Renaissance, people who put dark curtains over their windows so they could have a camera obscura, we would now take this dark cloth, place it over our heads, and focus and compose our picture. As simple as that. This composition is a little slower than our cell phone, but it's the same thing we're doing when we take our modern DSLR camera, always remember to remove the lens cap, and look through this viewfinder. This viewfinder is the same as this glass plate. As with all lenses, there are limits. This camera is limited because it does not have a zoom lens. I have to have a whole bag of lenses if I want to have a telephoto versus a wide angle. Our modern cameras allow us to turn a ring to give us wide angle and telephoto. And all wide angle does is let us take in a little more of the big picture. And all telephoto does is allows us to draw what's far away nearer. It allows us to change our social distance with our subject. But the problem with this rig, this style that most of us own, is that our lens is still inadequate for nature photography in the most part, particularly if you're shooting birds. Or if you wish to, uh, if you saw some deer come out of a clearing, our eyes would be able to see that bird very clearly. We'd be able to see the deer with her fawns come out of the woods very clearly, but the camera will not. The camera will take in everything. And that's the problem with this type of technology. What is up in the upper right-hand corner or the lower left-hand corner, when we look at the picture, is of equal value to what's in the center of the picture. And when you have too much information around your bird, or around your monarch butterfly, or around the deer, the viewer won't see it. So this technology also has its limits. And people are always saying, well, I, why, I, I bought this fancy camera. Why, why aren't my pictures like National Geographic? And, and let's face it, we can take National Geographic quality pictures on this trail. There are plenty of opportunities for really, really good pictures, just like any National Geographic photographer. But we have to remember that it's going to take an investment to do that. The reason National Geographic's pictures are good is that th th first you have the dedicated photographer who has trained their mind to see like a camera. That's the first step every photographer has to do. On top of that, they have incredible technology. And so on our trail here, our Washington Trail, if you want to be a bird photographer, if you are a nature photographer, you're going to have to invest in the technology that allows you to shoot nature well. And that involves, I'm loosening this, that involves expensive lenses. What I'm holding here is a modern 500 millimeter lens. They make longer and they cost a lot 
But if you want to be a trail photographer who dedicates their time photographing birds, wildlife, you don't necessarily need to buy this lens, but you will have to invest in a telephoto lens that is much longer than the traditional lenses that come with our camera. And so I want you to see that just like our ancient field camera there, when you purchase glass like this, you too will need to have a tripod. Tripods are not obsolete. They're a very, very important tool for any outdoor photography. And so we need to safely mount our telephoto lenses to tripods. So this means you're going to have to carry a little more weight out there in the field. Let me put a, a camera on here. So as you can see, the longer our lens is, the more we can take a distant object and bring it to our eye. And if I were to set this up, and ask a member of the audience today to come up here, I want you to first, before looking through the lens, just take in that scene and see what detail you notice. How many, what, what detail do you see out there when you're looking with your naked eye? Too much. Too much, <laughs> exactly. You're gonna see the street signs, you're gonna see the cars going by, you're gonna see the telephone poles, the wires. Now, take a look through the lens. So, so with this lens, we're seeing just a small, small set of leaves on one particular branch of this large tree. And that's why when we're seeing a bird in that tree, we cannot rely on our human eye or our short lenses of our camera. We will take in far too much information. We need a lens like this that will isolate that bird, that branch, that caterpillar. Thank you. And believe me, it, 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 this may appear large, but all manufacturers make much larger lenses than this. And so here's the dilemma with photography. The, the, no camera can do all the jobs perfectly. You cannot go to a camera store and buy one camera that will solve all your problems. It's physically impossible. But if you do wish to pursue the technology of telephoto lenses, first you'll need a tripod or what we call a monopod to support it. I highly recommend you don't strain your back. We want to walk this in comfort and enjoyment you can have a backpack with a tripod and all that stuff on you. But here's a neat solution I've come up with. When hiking any trail, I use a three-wheel baby jogging stroller. It's suspended, it's got suspension. I could put my camera back, strap it. I can strap my tripod on here using bungee cords. And I simply can walk any trail, I can be in a wooded environment in the Catoctin Mountains and enjoy nature by pushing my camera gear. And you could also use the handbrake so it doesn't roll away on you. Much more convenient than backpacks, just my practical solution. So in many ways you will have things in your garage already 
that will make your life a lot easier when you're actually trying to enjoy this beautiful trail. There, there are a number of manufacturers of cases for your cell phone that will allow you to attach devices that we can screw in what we call a cable release. We would attach it to the camera and fire remotely instead of pushing the button, which will vibrate the camera. The trouble with cell phones is many times we've got to press this screen button. And when we do that in the dark, it will vibrate our cell phone. So here's a helpful hint with your iPhone or your Android. Many of the programs for your cell phone camera will fire the trigger when you do a volume up on your, on your hands-free headset. Simply by pressing the plus button for volume up will fire many applications for cameras on your cell phone or your tablet. It's not 100%, certain app, certain, some apps won't do this, but I know the, the basic app in an iPhone will. So here you have a cable release that can steady your cell phone that comes with your phone. You don't have to buy it extra. From the ancient pinhole camera obscura, a darkened room that lets a light in through a little portal, we let light in to our cell phone through a lens, which is no different than the lens here or here. And then instead of recording to a sheet of film, we record to a digital sensor. And on this sheet of film, I have drawn a tiny little square, rectangle actually, that represents the size of the digital sensor in our iPhone or our Android telephone. That's it. That's how small it is. Yet that little sensor is able to capture such a huge array of information. Not as much as a sheet of 8x10 film, but still just a remarkable evolution of technology. So when, you, when, when you're interested in various cameras, you have to be aware that the sensor sizes are different. This sensor size happens to be analog and a sheet of film is eight inches by 10 inches. But our various DSLRs, our various point and shoots, even our cell phones and our tablets will come with different sensor sizes. The larger your sensor size, the more information you'll capture and the better quality pictures you'll have. So if you're interested in why it's different from this, these two cameras, and now we have cameras that are called full frame, well those full frame digital cameras, their senses are larger. They correspond to the same size that 35 millimeter film would be. But our original DSLR cameras had much smaller sensors than traditional 35 millimeter film. So the bigger you can capture, more information you can capture comes from a larger chip size. And that's really the evolution of photography. And what I'd like to do now is go out on an adventure on this beautiful trail, enjoy it, and, and overcome some practical photographic problems. You know, some, uh, come up with practical solutions for various photographic problems we see in the field. Are we ready for this hike? Excellent. Well, here uh, at the Washington Road Trail, you see for the birders and the nature people, they have established uh, bluebird boxes for us to enjoy. Uh, this is too late in the season to actually have birds living here. Their fledglings have already grown and gone. Uh, but we do have a nest inside. Uh, and so if this were a goal of yours to photograph, the natural thing is, you know, with one of these cameras is you want to be close. And with a, with, with a traditional telephoto lens on our DSLR, that's the telephoto setting, we have to be this close 
to the birdhouse. And if we were this close, the birds, the parent birds, would never return to the nest. They would be up in the tree waiting for us to leave. And their babies would remain silent because they, the mom and dad would communicate them that a predator, me, is too close. So the secret in order to photograph nature, whether it's, a, even if it's a squirrel or a, a chipmunk or a bird, is you have to be far away. And so over here, I have my gear. As you see, if you're, if you're going to do nature photography, you're really gonna have to pack a lot of stuff. And that's why I recommend, particularly on this trail, one of these little jogging strollers. It's, it's great, it has suspension, and it protects your equipment from the vibration of walking. It saves your, your, your strength. So let's talk about this. This is really the better location. Now that I'm far enough away from the birdhouse, the parents will feel more safe. The predator, especially if you don't stand up. If you make yourself smaller by getting down low, now less of a predator. And I also have a social distance from the nest that the parents will return. So you would set up your tripod. And of course, this lens is very expensive. So most amateur photographers would have a much more modest telephoto lens. And then we could ad uh, add what we call a multiplier or a, a telephoto extender, which is less expensive. And the two combined will let you get closer. Uh, it's less expensive to, to do it that way, but of course you're sacrificing certain things. And that's why professionals use lenses like this. It's about the light. And we have the bird bo a box in shadow. And because it's in shadow, we're gonna end up getting a slow shutter speed. And the slower the shutter speed, the harder it is to freeze the action of the animal we're interested in photographing. Think of your lens as a light funnel. So we would take out our camera and attach it to our long lens. And now with this distance from our, from our wildlife, such as this bird box, we can focus in to just the opening. Make sure I get this on tight. It's getting a little wobbly. Okay. And the other thing that's also good with uh, wildlife photography is not to have your finger up here on the shutter release. You're going to get tired. And if you're always here like this, staring through the and waiting to fire, your arm is going to get tired. So what we want to do is use what we call an electronic cable release. And some, some of your cameras may have this electronically where you can have a cable release built into your cell phone and press this button and it will fire your camera. Others might just have a dedicated electronic clicker to do that. This particular camera has to have it hardwired. And so we would attach our remote control And now we can make sure the batteries are in correctly. And now we could comfortably look through the camera, watch for the parent birds to show up, and then with this finger down here, just fire. That makes sense to everyone. So it's no longer that you're gonna have to be a hair trigger always you know, waiting to fire. You would do it with this 
much more comfortable. And the same with a, a remote clicker, an infrared clicker, what have you. And this is applicable to any sort of thing, especially when you have a remote control and say if you, uh, it's not birds, but uh, say if there was a salt lick here and you knew that deer always showed up, you can have your camera set up on a tripod, have your remote control, and you can hide over here behind the bushes. And with the remote control, the animal, a, a deer, uh, say that's a squirrel feeder with some corn on it, the squirrel will look at this camera and see it as an inanimate object. You're over here, out of sight, and you can fire your camera remotely. So this is applicable to all wildlife photography here on our trail. And for, it's, it's, it's impossible for me to show you the angle that this camera is, is getting, but right here, I want to show you right here with the camera trained on the bird ba box. I'm going to walk over now with this camera and show you where I need to be to replicate what I'm seeing here. So, this camera, if I were to see this picture with this lens, I would have to be this close to the bird box with this lens to get the same picture that I'm getting over there. There is no way a bird, a squirrel, a deer is going to let me be that close. That's why it's so important that if you are into nature, animal nature on this trail, you need to invest in a longer lens. So let's continue and let's look at other options that are not necessarily wildlife. We might be interested in plants or other things to photograph. Let's move on. So you have to take advantage of any season here. If this was winter, we wouldn't have blooming flowers. Now it's late summer, we have thistles. That doesn't mean we can't make a quality photograph here. I'm not a biologist, but if you have an interest in plant biology, this could be very fascinating to you. We will only see photographs that our mind is trained to see. So everyone who comes out to this trail will have a different interest, which is fine. That's what we want in Carroll County. We want a diversity of people from all walks of life enjoying this beauty. So in our mind's eye, we need to always anticipate a photograph. We need to be able to see down the walk on the trail the potential. So as I came down this trail, I saw the sun coming behind the thistles and that attracted my eye. So earlier I described how our mind composes a picture. And so I was in my mind's eye composing like a camera without the camera to my eye. I was framing and I was zooming in and out in my mind. And so we can zoom in and isolate these thistles to make a very attractive photograph. The other thing you have to remember in composing is where to put your subject. Too often, everyone uses their autofocus lens and puts their subject dead center because the autofocus is located in the center. I would encourage you to explore your cameras because most of our modern DSLRs allows us to physically move our focus points. And that's where these lines come into to play. This is what we call in art theory, the rules of thirds. We have our center line, both vertically and horizontally, but we also have these third lines. And this is actually where our eye prefers our subject to be. We don't put our subject dead center. What we want to do is put them off center. 
This allows for our natural scanning. And in composition, we rely on our natural eyes scanning in order to arrange a picture so it's more appealing. So what I'm going to do is try to compose this thistle, this thistle here, in relationship to the other thistles on a strap around my shoulder. But because we've brought so much equipment today for our discussion, I don't necessarily always have it set up. So let me set the camera up. We take the lens cap off, the body cap off. And also, if your lens has a lens hood, it is wise to attach it. This will prevent any stray sunlight from hitting your lens and causing what we call flare that will degrade the quality of your image. So normally, we would just be walking down this trail with it around our shoulder. We would see the thistle. I would approach uh, those who like to shoot, say target practice or whatnot, or shoot for hunting. We know those weapons, we always use a short camera, uh, a gun strap, in order to hold the, uh, the gun steady for shooting. The same is with photography. We don't want a long strap coming down our hip. I want it relatively short. I can put my hand through it. And because the thistle's vertical, I'm going to turn my camera vertical. What's nice about autofocus is that if you hold the shutter button down part way, it will lock your focus. And when I recompose, I can now move around and I keep the thistle sharp. And there we go. So I'm recomposing and this allows me to take a picture here and I may move this way, give myself some other opportunities. And the secret to any successful photo shoot is always to shoot more than one picture. Don't rely on your first initial snap as, a, as an idea that we now want to, may want to explore it with a wide angle. I go into wide angle, I can get very dramatic by getting low. I get myself in focus. And then I shoot up at the sky. Or I can go into macro mode. Macro mode means getting really, really close. And in macro mode, watch the thorns, but don't hesitate to have your hand to stabilize it in the wind. As long as it's not in the picture, no one will know. So again, as we journey this trail, in your mind you should be framing things ahead of time. When you see something that's interesting, then try to frame it off center. And don't be afraid to move in, particularly with plants, uh, say if there was a caterpillar, anything that's small, that's not gonna run away, fly away, the closer the better. So let's continue on down the trail and see what else we can learn and enjoy and photograph. Many times in this wonderful landscape, people have the uh, impression they need to photograph the large expanse of landscape. But in fact, it's the small details of the landscape that will really interest the viewer's eye in your photograph. So as I come to this bridge, I see this little stream, and what captures my eye about this stream is the sun reflecting in it through the clouds, as well as the patches of blue from the sky. So what I'm gonna do in order to do this landscape is try to capture that flavor. It's relatively dark here in the shade, so we will need a tripod. Of course, around water, be very mindful of not knocking your tripod off in the water. Okay, and so we have these beautiful orange flowers, the water that's moving, and the reflection of blue. So we have a lot of color tone. We have the green, we have the blue, we have the orange. And now we're gonna turn our camera vertically because the stream is flowing ver you know, vertically away from us. And I approximate where I want the angle of, of the eye to come from. And then I'll play with my zoom, zooming in and out. 
maybe shifting the tripod just a bit. I may even think of getting back a bit to include part of the bridge. All of these things are ideas that I'm gonna explore. Doesn't mean it makes the final picture correctly. Here we have the green and the orange in the foreground. Maybe we should have that in the foreground looking down on the stream. All these things you need to play with. So here I am. I'm going to include part of the bridge, part of the foreground flowers. And in photography, we always pay attention to the close-up detail, not far away. So it's best to place your focus in the foreground. So I'm, I'm actually focused on this pedal, but I can see the bridge and the stream flowing away with the touches of, of blue light from the sky. And I come in, and now I'm going to change my exposure some in order to make sure more is in focus. Right now, only this flower is in focus. So what I'm going to do is change my exposure. And of course, the wind is now picked up, so I have to wait for that flower to stop moving. And I'm shooting at a sixth of a second. That's why we're having a tripod here. So I'm going to try that so that I can get everything in focus. And now I'm going to photograph it one more time where only this flower is in focus. So again, I'm going to change my aperture to do that. And what this is called is depth of field. We're playing with the depth of field of the scene. I'm creating this illusion of focus from this plant deep into the picture. Sometimes we want to choose a very shallow depth of field where only this plant is sharp. And sometimes we want the plant sharp as well as the background. That's called great depth of field. So we're playing with these two features that is endemic to the lens. The lens controls how much is either in or out of focus. And with that successfully done, now we can move on to other locations. So many times on the trail, we're not interested in photographing wildlife or plants. We're just interested in photographing the people we're with. You know, we could be with our daughter, our son. We could be with our mother father, anyone who is of significance in your life. And then we take advantage of this beautiful scenery. But we, when we do a portrait of our friend, we don't want to have everything in the frame. We just want to use it as our backdrop. First thing we need to pay attention to is the quality of the light on the person's face. We don't want it splotchy where the sun is coming in and creating these spotlights. So we do want to move the person. So Aaron, take a step just about half back, right about there. But we do have this sky here opening up and filling her face. In the background, we have this bright tangle of foliage, which will make a very interesting background. For portrait photography, the best solution is not to photograph with a wide angle lens. Most of our point and shoot cameras, when we turn them on, they are at wide angle setting. Zoom out. Don't sh Most people make the mistake of just shooting the setting the camera automatically turns on to. So we want to go to telephoto because we want to isolate Aaron from the background. We just want a hint of the background. Many times we don't want to photograph at your own stature, but you want to move. I'm rather tall, so I want to move lower. Particularly if we're photographing children, if it's your own three-year-old or four-year-old, you don't want to tower over them. You want to get down to their level. So with Erin, I'm actually going to drop down a little bit, so I'm more on her eye level. And I'm going to pay attention to the background so I don't have tree spikes growing out of her head. And then if we can slide the glasses just a little close, there we go. Now, here's the other thing about portrait. Even though we're doing her face, her body translates up through her spine, her neck, and it'll appear in her picture. So Aaron, we want to get you kind of looser a little bit. Yeah, move around, and then just maybe rock your legs so you're not like, yeah. 
All of that happens, and that translates into the face. Now, now that Erin's moved, we now have a sunspot on her, so let's move slightly forward. Yeah, just bring that one foot forward. Good. That's nice, very nice. Beautiful smile. So again, I'm going to focus in on Erin, but I'm not going to put her eyes dead center. I'm going to put her eyes in the upper third of the picture so she fills the frame. So I bring myself down, I focus on her eyes, and then I recompose slightly differently, slightly differently. Yeah. And now we have this wonderful scene behind her face. Oops. And there we go. Lovely. So please take advantage of the Washington Road Trail, not just for nature, but for celebrating your loved ones. You'll have a great time. You'll have nice time to have a conversation and you'll come back with beautiful portraits. Let's continue. Looking. Uh, the other thing I would like to say is everything we did with uh, the DSLR camera, especially the portrait work or close-up work, you can do with your cell phone. You do not need a, an expensive camera to enjoy this trail. And if you wish to learn more about how to control your camera, such as when we did the landscape picture here, and I mentioned depth of field, Carroll Community College has wonderful uh, continue ed programs where I teach and other people teach uh, small courses in order to understand how your cell phone works or your digital uh, medium, whether it's point and shoot, uh, your DSLR, whether it's about lighting for portraiture. Carroll Community College offers us various classes that you can take. Well, I hope you enjoyed this so photo safari on the Washington Road Trail. If you need a brochure, please visit the Carroll Media Center, the YMCA, uh, Carroll Community College to pick one up. Uh, also, you can find information online through the wrctrail.org and on Facebook, where you can just uh, connect through WRC Trail. Uh, we enjoyed you having you on our adventure here. I hope you come back, take many of pictures, and I hope to meet you out here at a later date. Thank you.